Welcome back to Rushing the Field. He's Joshua Perry. I'm Nicole Auerbach. And Joshua, I warn you every week that I'm going to get mad about something. I am mostly just mad about the discourse around the college football playoff rankings this week. Poor Indiana at the center of it when really we should be nitpicking Penn State and Texas. But that is neither here nor there. Like we'll get into the rankings, but I've got to say, man. It is frustrating to see all of this conversation around which two loss SEC team would crush Indiana if uh, if they played on a neutral field. It's it is it's a weird thing that we're doing right now. And listen, I I get it because you look at the SEC and they certainly don't have the top teams like they've had in the past. I think if you put them one through eight, you can say that it is the most competitive conference, and there are some really good teams. However. I'm not going to sit here and cry about who gets left out of an expanded playoff. No. This is a, a team that wouldn't have had a chance to pursue a championship in any other year anyway. Like, go out there and win the games. Don't lose to teams like Arkansas. Don't lose to teams like Vanderbilt. Don't have a quarterback who throws as many interceptions as other quarterbacks uh, in different conferences who don't have a conference win yet. Like, these are the things that really bother me about the conversations we're having right now. I agree. And, like, the SEC is going to get four teams in. You want five? Like, I, I don't really understand what that is either. Um, this is, I don't think, going to be a year where, like, you're worried that you're going to miss out on the actual best team in the country. Yes. So let's dive into the rankings. We have plenty of time to sift through best, most deserving, how all of this shakes out. But let's start with this week's actual rankings. The most interesting storyline that I was following was how the SEC teams were going to be ordered, right? We talked about this um, all weekend. The idea that, okay, so so Alabama lost to Tennessee, Tennessee lost to Georgia, Georgia lost to Alabama. How do you handle that little like round robin there? Well, it looks like the committee did what I would do too. They said, we're going to go Alabama, Ole Miss, Georgia, Tennessee. So Ole Miss also has that win over Georgia there. So Alabama pumps up all the way to seven off of a must be very convincing win over Mercer. Ole Miss <laughs> checks in at nine, Georgia at 10, Tennessee at 11. I think this is the correct order, and I think that you can justify that separation between Alabama and Tennessee so that you can say, hey, that head-to-head -head doesn't play into this. But I understand and I respect the head-to-head -head mattering for Georgia, which is a team that I have projected into my final bracket. I think they get in. I think those three teams all get in with Texas, um, which, by the way, is still at number three despite the fact that they have zero top 25 wins. So – Ultimately, I think this is consistent with how the committee has handled the SEC teams, even though I disagree with where Texas is. Um, Joshua, did you did you have more of an issue with Tennessee kind of being on the outside looking in the, the one team that's going to need some help to get back into this? Absolutely not. No, I, I think they got it right. This is how I would how I would have it as well. Um, you know, it's it is tough. I, I will say, like, as much as we like to. Uh, jab at the committee and what they do like that is a tough job of ranking these teams that have kind of lost in round robin fashion um, but I think they did get the order of these teams right now to your point my biggest question and this goes back to the Indiana discourse that was really bothering me why aren't we asking that same exact question about Texas the one team that they played that would be a college football playoff caliber team they got destroyed at home they haven't played anybody else that's good. By the end of the season, the current SEC standings, they will have played six of the bottom seven teams in the SEC. It's the same thing they say about Indiana and yeah. who they've played in the Big Ten, and we don't have this conversation. I'm curious how they would treat a two-loss Texas if they lose to a and I think they should be completely out if that's how we're going to do this thing. But um, in, in terms of the Alabama, Ole Miss, Georgia, Tennessee thing, I think they got that right. Yeah, I do want to hit on that Texas point a little bit further because I am with you. I think at that point, if Texas were to lose to AM, they have no wins propping up this resume and they would have two losses in the games that mattered most. And, you know, for people who were saying, like, hey, the regular season needs to matter in an expanded playoff, well, like, those were the two games you had to win. Like for Georgia last year, when they got left out of the four team playoff, the one game they had to win was the SEC championship and they didn't win it. So if you want to say that that stuff matters and that there's stakes, well, there have to actually be repercussions for losing those games. And so I think that that would be a reasonable outcome for Texas, except for the fact that the committee has them at three based on no top 25 wins. I, I, I it's just it defies logic. And it's also how Penn State is being treated as well, yes. although Illinois in at number 25. There we go. That helps Penn State right there. These teams are just kind of there, I think, because of how they are supposed to be. 
how we thought they were going to be really good coming into the season. And honestly, I think their brand name, like I think that is helping them. I think it helps us think of the type of talent that they have, the players that they have, the recruits that they have on paper, what they look like. And I, I don't think that that should matter, but I thought it was really interesting that committee chair Ward Manuel went out of his way to say, listen, we look at strength of schedule, we have all of these metrics, but honestly, a lot of it comes down to how these teams play. That can justify anything, and I think that's what's keeping Texas removed from the rest of the, eight, the SEC, where, honestly, Georgia should already be above them because Georgia has two top 15 wins, including a head-to-head -head right. result over Texas. There's no reason that those teams should be seven spots apart. Yeah, I'm I'm there with you on, on the gap between Texas and Georgia. That's crazy. And and listen, I think the reason we do have a committee is so people can sit there and watch games and, and make a decision on how good they think teams are when schedules aren't balanced, when the competition is not balanced. It can't just be off of the numbers. So I'm totally here for that. But once again, it's really hard to justify Texas, to your point, Penn State. And I, I agree with this idea that I think the preseason thoughts that we had about these teams and what their grouping was in college football has allowed them to be ranked where they're at because, you know, they're yeah. one loss teams. It's it's a good record up to this point. I think the idea of their logo in the brand has shielded them from the type of criticism that other teams are getting right now. And that's the really unfortunate part about this is at some point we got to say, it doesn't matter what the brand is, and it doesn't matter what we thought they should have been in the preseason. Like We have to take into account some of the information that we've gotten up to this point. And if we're going to be critical about one team and a soft schedule and not having big wins, we should do that with everybody who doesn't have a big win right now. Yeah, the people who are arguing that the SEC two-loss teams or if there's a three-loss team should still make the playoff, they're not saying anything about Texas. Right. To all the criticism they've applied to Indiana – applies to Texas, right? If they're yes. like, well, Texas played Michigan and Oklahoma, they should be better, right? Like they tried. Well, Indiana had the two teams that played for a national championship last year on right. their schedule and they're in rebuilds, right? So like, again, uh, it's just been a wildly inconsistent criticism. And I feel bad that Indiana's at the center of it because it's incredibly dumb to be using them as the, the central point of this argument when they actually control basically their future in this game against Ohio State, right? Like this is the game that defines their season. It either gets them into the playoff or makes things really dicey. And they know that. And so it's a weird hill to die on this week of all weeks because we are actually going to play it out on the field, which yes. is what this is supposed to do. Speaking of teams that played it out on the field, BYU finally lost. We were waiting for that, right? Like it felt like a long time coming, had had a couple of escapes. They dropped eight spots in this week's ranking. So they went all the way down to number 14, which feels like it was the committee saying, okay, you were where you were because you were undefeated, but now that you're not, we can actually ding you for these games that you were not in control of, that maybe you shouldn't have won, maybe you got a little bit lucky, because that's a pretty significant drop and obviously has them on the outside looking in for the bracket. I mean, the only reason it's that significant of a drop is because the committee read Twitter a couple of weeks ago and decided to bump up BYU after a really shaky game that they easily could have lost to Utah because they think Utah is a pretty brand, right? Like this is, again, the frustration that we have if you're a viewer of this sport. I, I think they have it right for BYU. Like I, I have been on this train about them where it's been so inconsistent and it feels like they've gotten all of the lucky bounces to be able to win the games that they did. Um, certainly did not happen for them on Saturday. And now they're they're looking at the number 14 ranking. They got a huge game coming up too against Arizona State, basically an elimination game there in the Big 12. So uh, I'm curious to see how they bounce back. But for me, I feel like if they would have just kept BYU where they originally had them and just stayed committed to what they had originally which, said. It was nine. Like, they started at nine right. first week. And, yeah. and if you drop them from nine to 14, that makes a lot of sense. Dropping them from six to 14 is really hard to justify in, in my uh, opinion. Well, and it's just, it was frustrating about this whole thing is like the committee says, I love, I love quoting things back at them because then they can hang themselves <laughs> with their own words. The committee says that they start from scratch every single week when they're doing these mid-season, in-season rankings, which is always very funny because the chair always inevitably slips up and says something like, well, they moved up or they moved down. Hmm, well, you're supposed to be starting from scratch. They shouldn't be starting in the same place that they were last week, but that's exactly what happens. 
So this was a drop. Like you have to consider this an eight point drop. This was not an entirely fresh look at their resume. Right. I think it's exactly what you said. I think that they probably wanted to keep them at nine, felt pressure that they were under seated or, or sorry, under ranked the week after. And now they're about where they should be. The interesting dynamic, which is frustrating for anyone just looking at the rankings, is that SMU is ranked one spot in front of them. BYU yeah. beat SMU. Now, I know it was a long time ago, but it happened. Um, I know SMU has figured out a lot yes. quarterback since then. And I think that's what the committee has to lean on to explain that because head-to-head -head is supposed to be a differentiator if you're comparing teams directly and they're right next to each other. So that's something that also sticks out, but also that both of those teams are behind Boise State. Yeah, uh, I'll get to the Boise State point in a sec. I do think the the easy and proper justification is the difference in SMU making the quarterback change. I think uh, we see a team right now that is much more developed than where they were just a couple few weeks into the season. Meanwhile, BYU, it doesn't seem like they've gotten that much better from yeah. when they played SMU. So I can understand that if they justify it properly. Problem with me is it feels like they just throw darts at a board sometimes and, and see where they hit teams. And so I don't know if they could even go that far. Now, um, the Boise State thing is something that we have talked about. And I don't know if a lot of people have talked about it the right way or talked about it enough or were even aware of the idea that the top four spots do not have to go to power four teams. Folks have been arguing about this on Twitter, and it bothers me when people argue facts, but they have been like, oh, no, they have to go to the power four. No, they don't. No, they absolutely do not. And so we see now um, with the, the bracket in the seating, Boise State is going to get a first round bye if this were to start today. Yeah. So I think that everyone's done a really bad job of um, explaining and understanding awesome. the seating. Um, I mean, there was a time earlier in the season I clicked on something on ESPN.com and it straight up said the top four seeds went to power for champions. Um, yes. So that was wrong. And I just think it's been explained poorly um, throughout. And so I don't know that people have realized this. I've had people arguing with me with my projections all season that, you know, BYU at number four, why would they be ahead of Ohio State, et cetera? It's seeding. So this is <laughs> exactly like you have said for weeks now that this was a possibility. Boise State was always close enough in the rankings to the Big 12 champ. There was a little separation when they bumped Boise, uh, BYU up, but now incredibly close, two spots ahead of BYU. And that's all it takes, right? Because we know that five conference champions get into the bracket, but the top four get fives. The fifth conference champion could be any other seed, which again has also not been fully explained because a lot of people have said, oh, the group of five spot is the 12 seed. No, it's, that's is not. Is the true. 12. No, it's not. Not true. Not. Yeah. We're even in a scenario here, by the way, depending on how the ACC shakes out. I know that, like the Army Tulane winner, let's talk about could it. Get another buy and knock somebody out. Now, obviously, Army would need to beat Notre Dame this weekend. That's a tall yes. task, but that is also in the realm of possibilities here because it's literally just the five highest ranked group. I'm sorry, the five highest ranked FBS champions. There is no requirement that says that the power four conference champions make this thing. Okay. So let's paint a picture here. So let's say that Arizona state beats BYU this weekend. Okay. It's them in Colorado in uh, the big 12 championship and Arizona state ends up pulling it off. It feels like that's a big come from behind for them to do it. We talk about where teams start off in these things and where the ceilings are for them. That would be chaotic. Then let's say Miami loses and Clemson ends up making their way into this picture and they knock off SMU in an ACC championship game. And you have, as you said, undefeated Army. They take on a very good Tulane team. They end up winning that game. Could we have a scenario where it's Boise State as one group of five team that's in there on an automatic bid, and then you get an Army in there as well in an auto bid, and one of the, the power four conferences might even be left out altogether? Again, it sounds crazy, but there is a path. <laughs> to something like that happening. Um, and it, it's just, it's wild to think about, but that seed is really important and it's dependent on the order of these teams. Like you're talking about potential upsets in the big 12 and the ACC. These leagues are not super well positioned. The committee has taken pretty decent care of Miami 
after they lost, they're still in okay position here. By the way, where is their big win? They don't, exactly. They don't have one. They don't have one either. So again, Miami, Texas, Penn State, like we're looking at the, the committee just decided you guys get free passes here a little bit. I'm not having a, a, a resume defining win that's propping your whole thing up. This is where people get frustrated, right? Because you look at it and it's the amount of losses, right? Like they yeah. just see one loss. So they're putting them ahead of these two loss teams that have better wins. That is a separate conversation. But Miami yes, yes. is still well positioned. And again, you just have to be higher than champions from other conferences. The problem is what happens if they lose? What happens if they're upset? SMU on the outside looking in right now. You mentioned Clemson. They're down at 20. You've got the Colorado and Arizona State teams well down in the rankings as well if that ends up being the Big 12 matchup. So this is a very real reality that those leagues are facing, that they may only get one in and maybe if all the stars align, they don't get any. Meanwhile, as we look at the bracket, a couple other things that jump out. Notre Dame is now seated high enough to be hosting a first round game. You've we talked told about you that that, that was going to happen. We told yes, you, you've we been told on you. that. We told yep. you. What I also love, JP, you see the host Say sites of Say all it. these first round games. Columbus, South Bend, State College and Bloomington. In All Bloomington. cold weather. Could we have four snow games? That would be incredible. I would love it. It would it would warm my heart to see this. It's like every northern Midwestern kid's dream to make yes. them kids from down south come up and play with us in the snow. Um, it's phenomenal. It's fantastic. I know people down south are losing their minds. Of course, plenty of football to be played here. Obviously, Ohio State. And Indiana playing like could have something to say about the ability to host a game in that scenario. But the the idea that it is real and possible right now is something that warms my heart. I agree. And this was the dream for me, for sure, of looking at this and saying on campus games, like, let's get SEC teams coming up north and playing in those environments. It's going to be awesome. We cannot wait. You're right. Outcome of the Ohio State Indiana game going to drastically change this rankings, this bracket next week. Also, I think at this point, we can probably safely say Oregon is in the college football playoff. They clinched a berth in the Big 12, Big 10 championship game. Um, I think they can lose that and they would still be in. So yes. right now they're projected as the number one overall seed um, as the Big 10 champion. That would change. They would be an at-large team, but I think they're safely in. Everyone else, lots of work to do, and we will continue to cover it. Joshua and I will be back for our uh, weekend preview episode of Rushing the Field. We'll catch you up on news and notes across the sport uh, later in this week. But this will do it for our Rankings Reaction Pod. We'll talk to you again soon.